our final presentation this morning under the theme of the vet as the guardian of animal welfare is going to be given by Frida Scott Park, who is chairman of the Lynx Group. Her presentation is entitled Grasping the Golden Moment, the Vet's Role in Tackling Abuse in Animals and Humans, and it is kindly sponsored today by I4, the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Frida. Because this is a discussion forum, I've asked a question in my title slide, does the vet have a role in tackling abuse in animals and humans? And I hope that by the end of my talk, we might be able to debate whether we do or not. The other just uh, point I want to make before I start is that because I'm going to talk about abuse in humans, I would inevitably stray into the area of domestic abuse. And to forestall the usual comment that men are abused too, I do acknowledge that fact, but when you look at the gender bias, one in four women will suffer abuse at some stage during their lives, and 80% of the victims of domestic abuse are women. So forgive me if there is this gender bias through my talk. It's a bit complicated to do it any other way. So to start, I want to take you down um, a few personal memories that I have, how I became involved um, in speaking to you today. Turning back the clock, uh, the BSAVA received an invitation to attend a conference in London called Forging the Link. And I have to say that um, none of the BSAVA officer team knew what this conference was about, nor did I, their public relations officer, the little person who was sent along to attend this conference. It was held in the very beautiful surroundings of the Stationers' Hall, which is about as magnificent as this place. It was a very grey November day, and the Thames on which Stationers' Hall is uh, positioned was equally grey, and I can assure you that by the end of the day, our faces were to as grey as the sky. Everyone who attended that conference was profoundly affected by what they heard, much of it based on papers that had been published that year in the Journal of Small Animal Practice between May and August. Um, those papers coined the term the battered pet. Battered pets, I could understand that concept, but I didn't know what non-accidental injury was. Non-accidental physical injuries found in dogs and cats. Battered pets, sexual abuse. Munchausen syndrome by proxy, I hadn't really had any concept of what that meant. And as for factitious illness by proxy, well, that was way beyond my ken. And the thing was, during May to August, being um, a BSAVA person, I'd seen the papers in JSAP, but chosen not to read them. Why? Because they made very uncomfortable reading, and the injuries they described were outside my knowledge. That was until I attended that first Lynx conference. And then, at the back of my head, alarm bells began to ring. It started with kittens. Kittens seen during three episodes of PDSA summer locums. Kittens with fractured legs or tails. How many? About five over two summer periods. Kittens that had fallen off the bed, kittens that had fallen down the stairs, kittens that had fallen off cupboards. It took Helen Munro at that first Lynx conference to tell me that a kitten can fall from a tenement window three or four floors up and it might fracture its mandible but it will rarely break a leg. So what had I been seeing? A kitten falling off the bed? I'd accepted that totally at face value. Just after the conference in November 2001, the Lynx Group was born. A group of very interested veterinaries and humans came together. The Lynx Group has been in position now for 12 years. We're a multi-agency group that promotes the welfare and safety of vulnerable children, animals and adult, adults so that they are free from violence and abuse. And I entered the world 
of intentional harm. I learned to understand the culture that goes on in violent homes. And I borrow without, every time I speak, I borrow this quote, that in a violent household where animals are abused, people are at risk. And when people are abused, animals are at risk. And we began to explore us interested veterinaries in the Lynx group. We began to explore this concept of is there a possible link between animal abuse and human abuse. And we learned to recognize that animals, women, and children have one thing in common. They're easy to hurt. And we're not talking here about neglect or ignorance. We're not talking about teasing or tormenting. We're talking about intentional, deliberate harm for pleasure or indeed to control or to coerce a family member, or indeed as a response to external factors. Without a doubt, abuse happens, a web of deceit and harm that causes tears of victims. If we look back to November last year, there were headlines that made startling reading. You will recollect that a very well-known celebrity, Nigella Lawson, admitted and has admitted several times since then in more graphic detail than this, that her mother just didn't like me. A lady who wrote under a pseudonym in the Times on Saturday, November the 10th, said, my mother grabbed me by the hair, hit me, forcibly held my head under the gushing bath tap to wash my hair. She adored her brother, but she hated me. And another well-known Times columnist wrote about how his father committed serial adultery in a caravan that sat outside the family home, imposing huge psychological pressure on the young family inside the house and indeed on his wife. Tears of the victims. And as vets, we need to understand that many, many people have understood this problem of the link between abuse or cruelty to animals and in humans. Does anyone recognize this quote? If he is not to stifle, stifle his human feelings, he must practice kindness towards animals, for he who is cruel to animals becomes hard in his dealings with men. Anyone recognize that? Philosopher, writing many years ago. Immanuel Kant, Lectures in Ethics, 19... 1775, the late 1700s, this problem was recognized. And the thing is, as vets, we care deeply for the animals that we treat, and therein perhaps lies our blind spot. And it took Helen Monroe again to perhaps state the obvious. And she makes this quote in her book, Veterinarians in the main tend to be of the tender-hearted variety, caring deeply for the welfare of their animal patients, but also frequently feeling compassion, and I would in interject affection, for the animal's owners. How many kittens did I see that had broken their leg, that had fallen off the bed? I felt sympathy for the owner, I'm sure. Over the 12 years that the Lynx Group has been in existence, we've discovered that vets fall into three categories. There are those who don't see and don't hear. There are those that see and hear but don't want to know. And there are those who see, hear, and want to help. And fortuitously, it's this last group that is becoming larger and larger due in no small measure, I think, to the work that Paula Boyden, my colleagues in the Lynx Group, does with the final year veterinary students in our veterinary schools. So many vets have had questions over the last 12 years. We put a pet to sleep that had been neglected by its owners. Later, those people were neglected, were jailed for neglecting a child. <coughs> Excuse me, could we have made a difference? As a new veterinary graduate, I saw a client 
hit her child on the face. I didn't know who to contact, so I did nothing. It's haunted me for 20 years. So why should vets get involved? Without a doubt, our responsibility lies with the animal. And in fact, there are many good resources these days to help you through the minefield that is animal abuse. But vets, as already has been mentioned once today, are trusted individuals and may find themselves in the position of receiving information about further violence that occurs in the household, <coughs> what we call disclosure. And it's this element that makes a lot of my veterinary colleagues very, very uncomfortable. So disclosure, it's outside our comfort zone. So the first question is, do vets have the training and confidence to recognize abuse in animals? I would suggest we do. But what about knowing what to do when faced with a vulnerable human victim? Which category are we going to fall into? We see, we hear, but we don't want to know. Or we see, we hear, and we want to do something about it. We need to know what to do when abuse confronts us in the surgery or on the farm or with that equine client so that we never miss the golden moment. What's the golden moment, I hear you ask? It's a phrase I've learned to use with the help of my dental colleagues. The golden moment is that opportunity that we have as trusted individuals to extend some compassion towards a victim of violence. This single empathetic gesture of support may be the first time that anyone has shown any kindness towards a victim who may very well be very isolated. It's possibly this person, this victim, who brought in that small kitten with a broken leg. The kitten may, be, may have been used as a lever against her to get her to do something. Her refusal to do anything might have resulted in the injuries that you might actually be faced with in your surgery. The kitten may well have been the only point of contact she had, the only individual that gave her any source of comfort. And she arrives in your surgery asking for help for her pet. But can you afford to ignore what you are seeing? Obviously, not all victims are quite as evident as this one. However, studies have shown that domestic abuse, abuse survivors get huge comfort and relief from moments of compassion from people they have approached, particularly those who they trust and respect, like doctors, dentists, and veterinary surgeons. In addition, this might be the point at which they decide to seek help. Indeed, if their kitten with the broken leg or the broken tail may well have been removed and may well allow them to leave the, the household. So as veterinary surgeons, for us, it's knowing what to do. So the Lynx Group has worked rather hard over the last five years to produce an online guidance document for veterinary staff. And then key to this guidance, in partnership with Medics Against Violence, we've also produced a practice protocol. Under the umbrella term, the Domestic Abuse Veterinary Initiative, We've introduced four simple steps for vets to follow if faced with any case of abuse, whether animal or indeed human, in their surgery. It's based around something called the AVDR technique, about which I could talk for 20 minutes alone, and I've only got 15 minutes to talk to you today. Asking, <coughs> validating, documenting, referring or reporting is what AVDR stands for. We emphasize in our training schedule that vets are not required to be experts in animal or human abuse, but what we are asking is that they just have to be prepared to extend an empathetic paw and seize the golden moment. If we do that, we'll become part of a worldwide movement 
I can't tell you how big this is. The flashpoint perhaps came last year with the young Indian lady who was attacked and raped on a bus. You'll recognize that incident. And the movement towards zero tolerance towards abuse took, took hold. And you may well be familiar with this promise since that moment, one million men, one million promises, the Ring the Bell campaign, where they will interject in moments of domestic abuse. You'll recollect that two weeks ago, three young ladies were released from a house in America's Midwest. The black gentleman who went to their help said, I thought it was a domestic and I thought I should get involved. He saw this young lady shrieking from the door, please help me, please help me. The door wasn't big enough for her to get out, but he thought he should interfere. He's become a celebrity. So let's, let's join as vets. It does help if there are people who are well known. Do any of you recognize this young gentleman? We have a slightly older audience in the room today, but there might be people who do watch television <laughs> I, don't, I didn't know who this gentleman was until I heard him on the radio. His name's Jarmaine Douglas. He was runner-up in The X Factor. I have never watched X Factor, I must confess, to my shame. But this young gentleman is a seriously Im impressive person. He and his mother, Mandy, spent many years running from women's refuge to women's refuge, pursued by an ultra-violent, ultra-abusive father. Jarmaine Douglas has become a women's aid ambassador for children. And his quote is lovely, when you stand on the right mountains, you can see the beauty of life. I want to front women's aid and help make it a mountain of strength, a sanctuary for those who need it, and I'm proud to be part of its foundations. He was truly part of its foundations. So to conclude, we're not asking vets to become philosophers or indeed experts in abuse, but we are asking veterinary staff, nurses, receptionists, and veterinary surgeons to attend the Domestic Abuse Veterinary Initiative training schedule. We want to turn our profession into people who say, we see, we hear, and if it should occasionally confront us, we will grasp the golden moment. We know that we can no longer ignore the potential links between abuse to vulnerable humans and the link to animal cruelty. And together, we can help to stop violence. And I would like to thank my partners, the Lynx partners, in providing training for the veterinary team. We've just started with a pilot training scheme in Stirling on November the 17th last month. Highly successful, we plan now to roll it out around the countryside. You'll notice I have quite an interesting group of uh, partners. We've got the Violence Reduction Unit of, uh, as it's called now, Police Scotland. We have one kind, Libby Anderson has been a staunch supporter of ours since this collaboration uh, started. Our main partners, Medics Against Violence, we work extremely closely with them to develop training schedules and indeed produce the practice protocol. But I can't end my talk without thanking the BVA who've supported me in all my links work for the last five years. And particular to Jill Harris, who's sitting in the room here, who helps me on a personal basis with all the documentation that I need to produce for the guidance. It's a very difficult job, this. We've talked about vets in isolation, and there have been moments. It's a very slow grind, and I have felt totally in isolation when the doors of my very own Royal College are firmly slammed shut because they're not interested. It's not a big problem. We have some guidance in the code of conduct for veterinary surgeons. I don't think so. Not to the level we need now. But there are moments where I get great pleasure of being part of this worldwide movement of zero tolerance against violence to animals, humans, or children. And it's quotes like the next one that I want to share. And I'm very grateful to Peter Ginman, actually, for sending this to me last November. 
Many of my talks I call just making a start, and the reason it came to this was uh, from The Guardian last November. There was a quote in it talking about Glasgow. Uh, you probably know that Glasgow has a rather violent uh, history of culture, no longer. Um, Glasgow's innovative violence reduction unit can claim a large share of the credit, having piloted a range of unorthodox strategies to cut violent crime training dentists and vets to recognise the signs of domestic abuse. We took the attitude that it's so big and so complex, it doesn't make any difference where you start, said ex-VRU director, co-director, Detective Chief Superintendent John Carnahan said candidly. He said, just make a bloody start. And he's right, and it's quotes like that that make me proud to be part of this movement against zero tolerance. And the more we invite the veterinary colleagues to join us in this, the more supporters we get. So I hope I've answered the questions, should vets get involved in tackling abuse in animals and humans? But now, I guess Tiffany's going to open the discussion. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Um, Sean at the back and then Kate down the front, down here. Thank you. Um, Sean Wensley, a PDSA senior vet. Um, there are a number of things that vets should report. Um, things like suspected illegal tail docking, cruelty to animals, um, confirmation altering surgery, etc. Um, and PDSA has a number of practices and protocols in place that are regularly reviewed. Um, but I wanted to pass on that uh, a veterinary colleague um, went to your BSAVA session on this subject. Um, and like, I guess, many organisations, we now have an, an internal Facebook-type facility. Um, and he posted on there that it was the, um, the most interesting and affecting presentation that he went to. Um, he's going to get his team involved locally up in Scotland. Um, and we're also having uh, increasing methods of spreading good and best practice around our 50 hospitals. So I think all eyes are going to be on him and hopefully um, the other hospitals will start um, following his lead. Good uh, to hear. Thanks very much, Ruda. Kate? Kate Kerr, past chairman of AWF. Thank you, Frida, for a, a wonderful delivery. Very well put. I know you had enormous time constraints. But make no mistake, it occurs in the farm animal world equally. And it has nothing to do with intelligence either. There are some extremely intelligent people who have been grossly abused. And I had this explained to me by a cognitive behavioural therapist who said that you have two parts to your brain. One, your intelligence, and the second, your social emotional side. And if the social emotional side gets damaged or constrained in any shape or form, the intelligence side, your work, whatever, where you can shine and be someone, do something of worth, comes to the fore. And it then becomes very difficult to believe that person could ever have been abused. Never forget, you do not know what goes on behind closed doors. Thank you, Kate. I don't think I need to add anything to that. I'm learning. There's one at the back and then Michael. Christopher Wathis, um, Natalie, past chairman of Fork, Natalie, or soon to become past a professor of animal welfare at the Royal Veterinary College, and currently a hobby farmer of 20 years, not 49,000. And anyway, we've just had a very successful lammy. What I wanted to say was, have you thought about ever about turning the, the coin the other side and looking at the positive side of relationships with animals? For example, the person who's homeless who deals, who has a pet dog, or the person who rides, who takes part in riding for the disabled? I wish I had the time. <laughs> but you're right, there are so many positives. And indeed, I, I struggle to understand the mentality of the violence directed towards vulnerable humans and animals. And yet, it does do your heart good, doesn't it, when you pass the homeless person in the street and the dog is glossy and well-fed and the owner is anything but. And you just know that 
man loves that animal more than anything. Uh, yes, you're right to bring up the positive, because there isn't much of positivity in my work, apart from the fact that the collaborations we have make it a much better understood problem. Thank you, Chris. Michael Robinson, BVA. Uh, the question really is, um, other organisations, charities, including police forces that are involved in, in animal cruelty, where vets don't get involved, how much recognition is there of, of this concept? Um, and, and how has that been pushed forward? Recognition? Um, I've been doing this early work with Libby um, in Scotland. And what we discovered when we joined with Medics Against Violence and the Violence Reduction Unit of Strathclyde Police at the time, but now Police Scotland, was that uh, the police officers were in an uncomfortable position in that they were going into violence households. They have a zero tolerance on domestic abuse. And they no longer call it just having a rami with the wife. They go in as a criminal investigation. And the police were very conscious that from time to time, there was an animal involved, but they had no concept of what to do about it. And I have to say, one of my proudest moments was presenting in March last year to the police training, at the police training college in Tully Allen, to an audience of about 500 people interested in domestic abuse, and talking about the role of the animal in domestic abuse. And I was mobbed at the end from people wanting to understand what they can do. And the police are now receiving training. Um, and in fact, from a quick phone round that our colleague, Detective uh, Inspector Linda Borland did, of her eight area, police area colleagues, the stories that came out from that were quite abhorrent. Um, and the, the relief on the, the, fa the collective face of Police Scotland, realising that they now have colleagues they can work with to understand what they can do when there is an animal involved is, is, is quite satisfying. It is a true collaboration. There's a question down here at the front with Chris Lawrence and then one just over here. Chris Lawrence, AWF trustee. The young graduates are very fortunate now in that they get some instruction on this uh, at university. How do we get to the more mature members of the profession to get this message over to them? Yes, um, I talked about working in isolation. Apart from the very few veterinaries who were really interested in the concept of the Lynx group, um, I spoke to many, many people. Um, and it was mainly people around my age, probably mid-50s to mid-60s, who just refused to believe that there was a problem. Now, maybe some of these older members of my profession were in fortuitous circumstances where they had lovely practices with absolutely delightful clients 100% of the time. But the stories that I was getting from other areas, including um, from our current Royal College president, Jackie Molyneux, indicated that many practices were seeing problems with abuse and indeed beyond that, uh, domestic violence. How do I get these vets who don't see, don't hear, or don't see, or do see and hear, but don't want to get involved? Just as I show in this, really, it's starting with a very small drop. The momentum has gathered over the last five years. And Chris Lawrence has been actually very much part of that. Chris has been a part of the Lynx group since it started. And it's talking to people, it's working with people like Paula, who's going out into the veterinary schools. The more people you talk to, the more people come and join you. At the London Vets show in November, a lunchtime session, which as you know, can be notoriously poorly attended, we had over 500 people in the audience. And once again, we were mobbed at the end with people offering to help or tell us stories of their personal experiences. We're getting there, and soon the people of my age will be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's a question at the front here. Um, Gouda van der Berg, AHVLA, um, this practice background. Could you give us some practical advice what to do when the actual victim of human victims not there, but you get all these cows with broken tails or farmers pitching into a dog and, you know, for no particular reason that, or, you know, you see the farm dog and it looks very peculiar under its tail, that sort of thing. Where do we go? 
Good point. Um, that's where the training sessions really will come into their own. Um, I could, I could, we did a, train, a pilot training in Stirling. We decided to make it um, conducive to busy practitioners attending, so we started at midday. We finished at 5.30 and we realised we could have done with another four hours. Just from the interest in the audience, um, it is a very harrowing day, but also it's a very happy day at the end of it, as people realise at the end of that training session they know what to do. Tiffany's not going to allow me uh, any more time on this, I know, but it is a complicated problem. There is some help in the guidance document that I showed you. It's about to be produced from draft 68 into the first edition in the next two weeks with the help of Jill Harris, um, get my, myself putting the, the extra work in. There is a bit of help in that. And gradually, gradually, as we run the training sessions, you'll be able to build your own practice protocols. Um, David at the back. Uh, David Martin, Ethics and Welfare Group, BVA. Um, as someone who does a lot of reviews, a lot of these, and has some experience dealing with these for the RSPCA and others, um, if people have got cases which they're concerned about and want to discuss it with another vet, then by all means ring the RSPCA and ask them if they will put you in touch with someone who deals with this on a reasonably regular basis. Don't just think you have to survive in isolation and, and you don't know, you're left questioning it, because there is a knowledge of a body of knowledge within the profession now and a number of people who do have some experience in this and will certainly be more than happy to talk it through with you. I need to say any more than that. Really, the RSPCA or the SSPCA in Scotland are really the first ports of call for veterinary surgeons, familiar ports of call, but there is such a lot of help being offered from other agencies, women's aid, refuge, children protection agencies who wish to work with vets because they, we all know we can play a part. You'll notice that Crime Stoppers is a very much valued partner. Um, the involvement of Crime Stoppers in this movement is really quite astonishing. They are keen to hear about abuse to animals because very often it can form part of their jigsaw in pinning down violent individuals as they move around the country. The question at the back on this side. Fred McKeating, a trustee of AWF and um, also involved with the Veterinary Defence Society, which is one of the organisations to which people turn when they have a concern. Um, more often than not, we can help them by recognising that they're qualified to make a judgement and to increase, well, make sure that they recognise that they need to be confident in their assessment before they do anything else, which may mean going to the college for a little bit more advice or if they really are concerned, not to ignore the problem and to refer to the RSPCA, NSPCC, police or whatever. But the fact that they've got a concern and have contacted us, we'll often try and build on that and dissuade them from ignoring the problem. And it's a regular basis. We'll probably have one or two of these calls a week. There's a team of us that get used to just listening and saying, well, if you've got a concern, don't ignore it because you'll never forget it. Thank you. This is my moment to thank a certain Mr. McKeating, who during my isolated years where I couldn't get the Royal College to actually acknowledge that my guidance was going to be of any good whatsoever, uh, Fred encouraged me to keep going with various acronyms that used to come through the email. Just keep going. Don't let the... Can I say the word? Bastards grind you down. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and I think our final question from the front. Hello, it's Jenny McKenzie from the RDSVS University of Edinburgh, fourth year student. Um, I see myself as, well, I see myself hoping to be a veterinary practitioner that sees that hears and helps. And as a student at university, at the University of Edinburgh Vet School, um, we are very concerned with vet student mental health and mental health as we progress into our professional careers. Um, but would you be worried about any consequences of um, the veterinary professional mental health or within the professional um, realm if this kind of strategy was kind of rolled out throughout the profession, would you be concerned about any consequences in that? That kind of, is yeah. a really complex question that you've asked just before lunch and everybody's tummies are rumbling. 
You've, you've almost asked me two things there. I maintain at the moment that vets are really, really find themselves in a very difficult position because they don't know what to do. The veterinary training schedule very firmly puts vets back in control, knowing what to do when indeed they're faced with an animal that has been abused or indeed if the next step, which is a big step onwards, if a human has been abused. And I, I, I would reckon that most veterinary surgeons, once they're in control, are in a happy place. But you're right, we are a very vulnerable profession for a variety of reasons. And um, there's somebody who's already spoken today who has in, been in a position of suffering domestic abuse. And um, it's actually rare that we run any form of talk or training schedule that we don't get somebody coming to say, I've got a friend, or I have, or I know somebody who is, or I have seen something that I'm not happy with. And therefore, I would maintain that it comes back to transparency and opening the doors and putting us in control and opening the wider community so that there is help for the vulnerable individual, whether they're a vet struggling with the concepts or the vet not knowing what to do. But thank you for your question. Very complicated. OK, we don't have any more time for questions, unfortunately. It's now definitely time for lunch. So I would just like to thank Frida again, but also to thank... Um, David and Gerard for, for their important contribution to our exploration of the vet as the guardian of animal welfare. And we need to be back sitting down again at 13.45 after lunch. <laughs>